Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to West Valley Center for Spiritual Living. My name is Reverend Clyde Goings. I'm the assistant minister here. I want to welcome you guys here. Uh, when we were when we went in to pray, there was hardly anybody here, and I'm like, well, I don't know where everybody is today. But when we came out, I was really excited to see everybody. So welcome. And then all you people that are online, welcome to you too. We don't see you, but we welcome you as well. So. Um, anyway, so um, it is now spring, you guys, and um, obviously we can feel it here for sure. It's beautiful outside, and I get to um, just spending some time out on my patio. So my, my question I want to ask you guys, I was thinking about this this morning, is that, um, so um, what dreams are you planting today? Right? So what dreams are you planting, not only today, but for tomorrow, for this year, for next year? I mean, it's time to start living them again, Right? And then how about what experiences are we nurturing right now? And are there the experiences that we want to nurture? And then, of course, if they're not, then what weeds do we need to pull? All right? So let's start pulling those weeds so we can start experiencing. I mean, it's, it's exciting. We've got beautiful weather. We've got whole new beginnings happening. So let's be a part of that and, and, um, and planning that for our lives. So... So, as always, we come together every Sunday to remember that truth, right? We come together to remember that we're that individualized expression of God that gets to experience the life that we want to experience. And Reverend Karen helps us remember that every Sunday with those golden nuggets of those truths of who we are. So, just simply allow yourself to breathe in this beautiful, beautiful spring morning, this beautiful message, and this beautiful loving space right here and right now. So I'm going to ask the Bradfords to open up our hearts and minds for us to so just get settled in your seats as we begin the service. Thank you. So just relax and take a deep breath and get into that peaceful space. <laughs>
right here, right now, in this quiet place, the quiet where we can slow down and hear that still small voice of the divine that lives and moves and has its being in through and as me, in through and as each of us, in through and as everyone, everywhere. I know that that divine wisdom is in charge here in this day. The divine wisdom guides every thought, every word, every deed of each of us as we listen to this. We open our hearts and our minds for the beautiful message that Reverend Karen will give us, that opens our hearts, that lifts us, that allows us to see the divine that flows through her to us. And as we move forward, we do so knowing that as we breathe in, we breathe in life. And so I release this beautiful day out into the law, knowing that it always says yes. And so it is. I'm going to read the prayer that is accredited to St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me a channel of your peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring, tr may bring, may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope. That where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved, for it is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that, it, that one is forgiven. It is by surrendering that one awakens to life. Just allow yourself to take that in. And so it is. So that is my favorite prayer, and we just so happen to do a song that is exactly that today. It kind of lined up together. It's called Peace Prayer. means of your Good morning, everyone. 
something about this day feels like there's some kind of perfect order going on and it's kind of exciting me and I have something to say and I love how we all just coordinated and aligned and even Reverend Clyde was speaking right out of my talk. I felt like, did you look at my notes when you decided what you were going to say? So we are on to something and it's something big and something good and it's just so beautiful to see your faces here. And it's so wonderful to acknowledge all our friends online. Thank you for tuning in and watching. And um, let's just jump right in, shall we? The title of my talk is Make Me an Instrument. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is that good? Is that really good? See, they all did really well. We did not even talk about it. I just put the talk title out there, and they all came through. And um, you make my job really easy, and you also make me look kind of good. So. <laughs> So we are talking about this beloved prayer. I loved when Kathy said, this is my favorite prayer, that prayer of St. Francis. That's my favorite prayer. St. Francis was the, was the saint that is known for all the animals, and I could see why that would resonate with you because uh, Kathy and Rod have a gorgeous home I've been blessed to visit before. And, um, and they have a lot of wildlife right on their property, and not to mention a couple of wild sons. <laughs> so, so this whole idea of the prayer of St. Francis, Lord, make me an instrument, for me has such beautiful meaning in the way it synchronizes with what we teach right here in this tradition, in this spiritual tradition, that no matter what's going on in the world or what's going on in our lives at any given time, that we can remember there's always that space of peace at the center of our being. There's always those divine qualities of love and, and joy. And so our, our personality and our moods will, will vary depending on our relationship to the, uh, the, the things going on in our life. But the truth of our being is that as we make ourselves an instrument, meaning that we sort of clear the way we allow moments during the day where we get rid of the debris in our thinking that clogs the, the, the it, that stuffs it up so that we can't feel the peace anymore. Or we can't sense the, the love or show up in the ways that we'd like to show up in terms of the characters, the type of character we exhibit as we're moving through life. So our peace is there and it's only diminished based on our response to, to what's going on. So I was thinking that what a lovely idea it would be to not only be open to it and to clear our thinking and to do some of the things I'm going to talk about today as a step-by-step -step process, but wouldn't it be lovely if we could begin to train ourselves to expect it, to expect to have joy during the day, to expect to have um, experiences of deep peace, and expect to have encounters where you can really feel and sense that love. Don't you just love the Bradfords when they are singing? I'm thinking there's something in music that opens our heart to where that love is, is flowing. I, in fact, I often say, Hugh and I watch all the music shows on TV. You know, it doesn't matter what network, doesn't matter what their format. We like to see that up young, up and coming young talent, which is why I can say Scotty McCrary. Um, because he was on American Idol or something. But we love that. And what I love about it is that I can be just watching TV and have that very um, um, visceral experience of feeling my heart open. And sometimes it brings tears to my eyes and you hear their story, but then you witness their talent. And I think that's the same thing that happens for me. I'm noticing that I think I mentioned to Sue before we, before we came out. When you were rehearsing the opening, the Michael Gott song, um, oh, somebody help me. Quiet Place. Quiet Place. Uh, quiet place. place. Right, right, right. Oh, as soon as I hear you hitting, the, there's something in the guitar now that now speaks to the part of your being that recognizes what we do when we sit in that sacred tone. And that was one of the reasons I asked that we make a change when we reopened after the shut down the lockdown, that we have a regular piece of music there that will always touch us and, and it's working. So there's some way we open ourselves and say, God, life, make me an instrument of that, whatever that is, that love or that joy or that, that deep reverence for life that I sense in the experience of music. 
and let me have that. And by the way, I think everybody, I don't understand why people wouldn't watch all of those music shows because they make me feel so good. It's always an uplift, always an uplift. So, um, but of course I understand we're uniquely individuals and we don't all like the same thing. But I love this idea in, in, in speaking of a, of a spiritual tradition or a spiritual teaching. I love this idea in the way that we have an emphasis for um, really knowing that we do not will things to happen. We don't use prayer as a means to convince God of, of anything. But rather, we use prayer to make ourselves open up so that things can happen through us. So when I say, um, make me an instrument of love, then I'm opening to that experience of divine love so that it can flow through me and be on the earth. Now, a lot of these ideas, um, as I just spoke to them, uh, come from the, teach the work of uh, Thomas Troward. And so I spent some time looking at that this week, and Troward is, is strong on, um, well, he's, he's where we get all the law-based uh, part of our teaching. We're just home, studied Troward and loved that and wrote the Science of Mind textbook and created this teaching, and we have this beautiful spiritual philosophy that says, from the words of Troward, that God is an originating uh, power. What did he call it? Let me, let me look at here. An originating principle is the way that Tr Thomas Troward worded it. So Troward was a great metaphysician. He had been a judge in, um, in England, and he had a legalistic way that he related to life, and he also was really edgy in like quantum physics before it was... Uh, really known like we speak of it today. It was around, but it wasn't well known and it certainly wasn't respected yet. So Troward would call it an originating principle. And what he means by that is that there's this intelligence in the universe that created everything. This is pure Troward. Ooh, Reverend Cheryl must be really excited right now because nobody loves Troward any more than, than Reverend Cheryl. Uh, for sure. Amen. Oh, could you hear that? <laughs> Going all the way to the West Valley. Um, so Troward would say that there's this originating principle that created all things. And so everything that it made, that everything that is created through that principle has to be of it. Just like um, we have parents and we inherit traits from our parents. But what he's saying is that there's that divinity in all of us. We cannot separate ourselves it's inherent in the way that we were created. And so um, what that means is then when we have desires to have love in our life or we have a desire to have peace in our life or joy or, or order or whatever it is, when we have those desires, because we are created in the image of likeness of that which created us, we have inherent within us the, the, the means to have that love or to have that peace or to have that joy or, or any of the uh, things that we're looking at this morning because they come from that originating principle. So it helps me understand what it means when we say, this is good, um, um, it, is the, um, it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Right? So it's already inborn in us. It's the Father's good pleasure. It's the Father's good pleasure because that is the delight of God when we express those qualities in our livingness. And that's sort of the, the yeah, that's a good amen. And that's sort of the short story, the short version of, of the meaning of life. I think he does it in such a good way. So you know, what Troward says is so to the point. He says, that which created us would not give us the desire without the ability to fulfill that desire. And every now and then I have to remind myself of that truth. Right? It's good to know that. So the bottom line, and I think this is where you started stealing my show, Clyde. Um, the bottom line is that um, the answer to every problem and this is really Holmes, but you can see how Holmes takes it from Troward and, and all the other people he studied, because a lot of great thinkers have thought these same things. 
Um, the answer to every problem is in our spiritual realization or our recognition of the, um, the ultimate reality of, of the universe and how things work and how we, the life gets to be the way it is. And we're always participating in that. So I like this. These are my words. I like this version of that idea. The, the answer to all our problems then we will find the answers in the way that we draw our attention to holiness. You know, the way that we can, you know, quit looking at what's broken, at the problem, and refocusing our attention on the holiness of life. So no matter what's going on, your life is still holy. You are, you are gifted with the fullness of, uh, you know, you're created in the image and likeness of love. So even if it feels like that's missing or limited in some way, we still have the ability to create an experience that fulfills that desire for, for whatever that would be. I love that. Lord, make me an instrument. When I'm happy... I am God's instrument of, of joy. When I'm serene and confident and moving through my life with that, um, with that sense of security, I am, I am an instrument for God's peace. I'm open to allow that to express through me, so God's delight is to have that experience of it through me, through my living and through your living. So to be an instrument, then, is to be used as a portal for God to express on this planet. That's a short story. I think it's the whole reason we're here. Now, the, the steps, the processes, the spiritual work or methods that we use will vary from faith to faith. You know, we all have different interpretations on, on how to uh, have what we desire to have in our life or how to live our life in a spiritual way. And what I want to say is that, that that idea of making me a vessel is, is, a, is the best starting point. Because when we're talking about uh, opening ourselves to be a vessel, opening ourselves, clearing the debris away so that spirit can channel through us, that can, spirit can express in our lives to have that delight that it desires to have, those are the times where we have been quiet, where we have um, moved into that sort of that place of surrender that, that it's almost like a prayer request in the way that it opens us then to receive. So uh, an important part of, of anybody's spiritual uh, work or spiritual practice or the way you do your daily devotions, however you refer to it, is being quiet. Be still and know. And so that's, that's the starting point. That's the most important first step we could take, and that's very passive. And it's probably difficult for us because we are really comfortable doing. We're, we love thinking and being intellectual, and we like doing, and we um, uh, many of us are willing to be responsible for our actions, not all of us apparently. Um, as, as you look at the world, it makes you think or wonder anyhow. But there's that passive side, but we don't do that alone. We put that together with the active side. And in fact, that is why Holmes always spoke to the idea of love and law. There are two elements in this game. And some of it is surrender and some of it is choice and active decision making and taking actions that align to those qualities that you desire to experience or express in your very own life. I think that when I have been quiet in the morning or in the evening, but in the morning I notice that if I have my sitting practice before I do anything else, it changes the way I move through my day. So as I sit and open myself, maybe even say, uh, God, make me an instrument of your love this day. I'm affirming. I'm moving into that space of pondering and contemplating 
and beginning to feel what does love feel like again. And I, I begin to feel that and sense that in my being. And then as I step out into my day and I begin the activities involved in my day, I'm going to be more aware when I step out of that path of love. It's going to be, it's going to be more um, apparent to me, more noticeable, because I've anchored myself in what it feels like when I've been doing that sitting practice. Now, when you pair together doing and being, we take the passive and the directive. It would be like um, the simplest way of, of example is that prayer is when I talk to God and meditation is when I listen for that divine voice, that divine wisdom in my life. So when I pair those together, now I have something really, really powerful that I can use. I will know very quickly uh, we call that the witness consciousness. When you're when you're pray, when I'm prayed up, and when I have set in that space of, of feeling and sensing those divine qualities that I'm affirming for my day, then I'm I'm going to have that strong sense of witnessing or observing my own um, responses or reactions to life, and then I can realign myself more quickly if I am not heading in a direction that I want. And that's the whole point. And those are really the steps when we talk about um, the steps to, uh, uh, to spiritual uh, uh, activities that lead us to a more successful and pleasing uh, experience in life. I'm reading a book called um, Friendship. The title of the book is Friendship. And... It's, it's an interesting read. It has made me, well, number one, as I, because I've been reading the book for a couple of weeks now, and it's not an easy read. It's not like sit down and, oh, it's enjoyable. It's like you have to really think because it's all about the neuroscience of, you know, the mechanics behind um, friendship. It's about the um, sort of scientific view from the new research coming out of neuroscience um, that speaks to the biological and the psychological uh, foundations of relationships. So it's um, bulky to read, so I'm not trying to read, I read it in little bits so that I can take it in and, and appreciate it. But because I was writing this message and thinking about this message all week, I realized that this week my prayer has been, God, make me an instrument of your love so that it shows up in my friendships. Because friendships are, are a valuable part of our uh, connections with each other. In neuroscience, they're telling us the one thing um, that may be the most important thing is that, and I hear it everywhere now, the brain is clearly wired for connection. So for us to have been separated for almost a year, and not, you know, permitted to gather in community in the way that we know those who, people who belong to a spiritual community, you know, miss that. We miss that way we are called to, together. And we can see that it deprives us in some way of those things that we yearn for. And the, re, and the whole reason some of us are here in, in community. Um, and the Zoom, the, the online groups are really, I have to say, I think that they're more fulfilling than I anticipated they would be. When I get on a call with my colleagues and um, we're ha we have regular meet minister meetings in, in different you know, conglomerations of, of people coming together, um, what I see is that, that first, when we first get on the Zoom call, all I want to do is look at their faces. It's like, oh, oh, look at you, look at you all, and then you laugh and you see their expressions, and I realize that's what we've been missing. Right, so Zoom will feel it, you know, feel pretty good. Zoom will help you feel pretty connected, or other ways you use, we use our devices to see our the faces of our grandchildren or whatever. Um, but friendship is um, so important to uh, to us in our personal growth. So the idea of friendship in this book is defined this way: a friendship. It's not just somebody you meet and call your friend, but a true friendship is defined as a long-term, positive relationship that involves cooperation. So it's long-term. When, it, when I hear that, when I read those words, what I realize is, oh, we build it. 
what we share together is cumulative. And even as I'm looking around the room at the people that have been in my life for some more years than others, and, and, and when I think of like Ed, our, board, our current board president, I didn't hardly know you before you were on the board, and now Ed and I have a very close friendship because we have built that. And then the second thing it says is a friendship is a positive relationship. That doesn't mean it's always like, woohoo, you know, let's, let's sing kumbaya. It, it doesn't mean that. It means that your, your intention is very positive and that there's a willingness to work through the, the places where you bump up against each other because you should be bumping up against each other for that same reason that you're not all watching the same TV shows that I watch, <laughs> right? We have, we have unique preferences. Um, and then that third piece of it, it involves cooperation, I think is beautiful. What I notice is the longer I'm in relationships that become um, good friendships that I can feel in my being, um, that, that those then are the, um, the, the, the ways that we learn to move and, and weave in this thing called life, or in the examples I shared earlier, in this thing called church. Right? There's a way we come together. We have a board meeting today that I'm actually pretty excited about. And so what I know is that it's a bond. And because it's long-term and because it's ongoing and because it involves po a positive, you know, if you throw it all together, how does it feel? If it feels good, then that's a, that's a friendship. And, and it gives us an opportunity for cooperation. Now, the... There's a term in Gaelic, comes from the Celtic tradition, there's a term um, called Anamkara. John O'Donohue wrote a beautiful book by that title, Anamkara, and it means soul friend. It's not just a friend, but it's a deep, something in your heart is stirred. So sometimes we know when we first meet somebody that, oh, that person needs to be in my life. You know, that, that I can feel there's some kind of connection there. And we're not always blessed with maintaining that. Um, and other times, uh, a strong friendship comes from um, a, 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 a lot of cooperating and finding your commonalities and spending time together. And in this book, it talked about it, made me think of you, Julie. That, um, that the friendship creates a place where we can talk about anything we want, and it might even be sharing a, a good movie you just saw or a really wonderful book you're reading, but there's something in the telling and the sharing that feels joyful and fulfilling. Julie and I sat in the sanctuary for way too long last week. <laughs> One of us should have called it a lot earlier than we did, but we had so much fun talking about what we're watching and what we're thinking and what we're doing, and you can see how that then builds the relationship. So Anamkara is when you begin to build a friendship where the heart is involved and there's feeling. There begins to be, you care, and you have a, a, some, some reaction at, the, at, at that feeling level. So the soul, it, it, when you have a true friend, then your souls come together and there's healing that happens sometimes in the context of a, did you see that guy, that Scotty McCrary? You know, there's something that happens as we begin to share those conversations that, that can be very healing to us. And of course, there are lots of other elements of conversation that could be healing as well. But what they suggest in the studies is that that soul friend is that other person doesn't necessarily, it's not usually family. It can be family, but you know, we didn't pick family. Sometimes beautiful friendships come in, in family relationships, but the best, the, you know, what does Oprah call Gail, her, her BFF or something? You know, those friendships, the, 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 they help us to integrate, to integrate sort of all of our own loose ends. So we're all walking through life and we're wondering about things and we have questions and we talk and share ideas. We don't necessarily come to agreement, but all of that then is a part of that process of the individual's integration, coming into the, um, 
the, the wholeness of who you are and why you've been called to the planet at this time. And because of that, we tend in a true Anamkara friendship, a soul friend, we tend to call forward out of that other person the great gifts that, that they are here to give. We clarify our, our purpose when we sit in, in the witness of somebody else's greatness like that and, and the way that that love um, has some kind of um, tenderizing effect to, to what's happening, to that growth process. So in that book, John O'Donohue's uh, Celtic version of Anamkara, he says this, Anamkara permits us to enter the unity of ancient belonging. We enter into the unity of ancient belonging. It's like we stand back and something in us awakens that instinct for connection. And ultimately, whether or not you have a BFF, you know, whether or not you can identify an Anamkara in your life doesn't matter because ultimately all of that is intended to lead us to the bigger truth, and that is how do we nurture our relationship with God? So Lord, make me an instrument of your love so that I might be a good friend. I've been saying that a lot this week. In a Buddhist perspective, I want to talk about Thich Nhat Hanh for a moment. Thich Nhat Hanh is, um, actually he made his transition recently, um, is a Buddhist monk. He's the Vietnamese monk who brought us this idea through the Vietnam War of the necessity for um, engaged, what did he call it, engaged Buddhism? Do you remember? I, you're a Buddhist, you're kind of buddhist -y. <laughs> I think it was engaged Buddhism. So, you know, so we think of Buddhists as peace and calm and monks and they, you know, they don't work, they go collect their alms and, and um, but in the jungle, in the wartime, they realized they had to do something to help the people. They had to be more active. So it's sort of a, a awakening of a, of a activism um, under the idea of Buddhism. Thich Nhat Hanh said there are some important questions to ask when you are uh, looking at friends. These are questions he suggests that we would um, um, share with people in our life in, where we are building relationships, and I think they are stunning. In fact, I will admit to you, they scare me a little bit. So could you... Here's his first question he recommends that we share with each other. Could you ask a friend? <sighs> Heart's palpating. <laughs> Do I understand you enough? Yeah, right. <laughs> Is that a big one? I know, it actually makes me a little weepy thinking about it. More than that, then I reverse it. And I think about being in that position where a friend that I care about deeply would say to me, do I understand you enough? How would I respond? I think we're talking about some really courageous um, work here. And so here's the next question. Do I water your seeds of joy? So that one's a little easier, except then he ends it by saying, do I water your seeds of suffering? See, sometimes we think we're, we're in friendship and we think that um, if a friend is suffering, that somehow we need to make them feel better. But a true Anamkara friend, a soul friend, will follow the instinct to not make you feel better. Will sit with you while you cry, will curl up in bed with you while you sob if you need that. There, there are different ways and not say, you wanna go to McDonald's? I'll buy you a shake. <laughs> Right? Because it's much easier to do that. Or would you like a glass of wine? You know, it's much easier to try and um, make that person feel better than it is to just sit with them while they're suffering. So those are good questions. Do I water your seeds of joy and do I water your seeds of suffering? Do I give you space so that you can share the pain in your life 
and that I can just be a clear presence so that you can begin healing? Another good question, but here's the one that really frightens me. The question is, please tell me how I could love you better. Please tell me how I could love you better. And then again, I would invite you to be in the receiving side of that. If somebody you really cared about asked you, because these are intimate questions. If we don't have these conversations at this level of intimacy, how would it feel to have your, a dear friend say to you, please tell me how I can love you better? And I don't think we should have quick responses to that. I love just throwing them out there so you can ponder these questions during the week. And I don't know, as a couple, that does scare me to death. It's like, are you really uncomfortable right now sitting next to each other? <laughs> oh, she's a, totally avoiding eye contact. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> she's taking notes. Oh, it's a, it's a Lulu. Are you ready? Yeah. Please tell me how I can love you better. Please tell me how I can love you better. Ooh, that one scares me so much. They might answer. <laughs> Now imagine you're having that conversation with God. And see then that as you go over those questions again, it changes everything. So how will you open yourself to be used by life? How will you say this week, probably today, maybe even this morning while we're sitting here getting ready to pray, make me an instrument of your, and you get to fill in the blank. Lord, that's talking to the law. In metaphysics, we say that the Lord is the law. I think of that scripture that says, um, concerning the work of my hands, command me the way that it really, if you read that interpretation in its purity, it's really God speaking to us. Child, concerning the work of, of my hands, command me. And so we sometimes say we put our demand on the law, and so another way to put my demand on the law is to say, Lord, make me an instrument of your love so that I can be a good friend. Thomas Troward um, wrote that when we finally get that, get to that point where we finally get there, where we really truly recognize God as that ultimate reality, we will be we will be in that place of beginning to understand the work of love and law, the work of law between us and the action we take, and the way we use our thinking to direct the choices we make in our life. He says, when you get to that point where you fully recognize that, you embody it, and you, you start living from that space of knowing that there is a power and a presence that is greater than we are, and we can use it, we can call on it, we can open ourselves to be an instrument of it. When we get to that place, he says, all the mysteries unfold, and you will finally see the perfect order of the universe. A wonderful thought. Wonderful thought. And so I'm going to close this morning with a quote I found. I've never seen this quote before. I'm not even familiar with the book it came from or the writing. It's from Dr. Ernest Holmes, and um, it's indicated that it comes from something called the light of God. And here's the, the beautiful quotation. Common oh, Ernest Holmes, I always hear his humor. <laughs> Common sense should teach us that we did not create the universe, nor do we need to be responsible for the laws of nature. All we can do is use them. Now, now, my friends, now we are called to reform all our thinking to make a complete and final surrender of our littleness. Ooh, all right, so I want to want to really anchor these words in the uh, the profound 
work of prayer. So get comfortable where you're seated because we got some work to do. Take a breath. And allow yourself to just feel that divine inspiration moving through you. Knowing that that breath indeed is the kiss of life. The very way the creator has kissed us into being. And so we rest in God and we know We know that right where we are, God is, and therefore that infinite intelligence of all the universe is right here in this very room. It is immediately accessible at the core of our individual being. It is everywhere at all times. There is no place where God is missing or limited in any way. And so I feel the love of God within me. I feel it stirring as though we have, we have stirred the, the embers of a fire that is reigniting so that we can feel that power and we can sense that presence. We can rest in this beautiful truth that there are steps to our spiritual journey that we can practice, that we can devote our life to. And so in this day, I simply renew my own commitment to be an instrument of of God's love. I remember yet again that there is a way that all of the spiritual principles work on this planet, in this universe, and in this grand and glorious way. I give thanks that we can study the science of the brain and see the spiritual ways that God lives in us and through us. And I I feel the joy in acknowledging that it indeed has been the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom here and now. So we step aside and out of the, any idea of littleness. We realize that this life is filled with potential, that this is that, that the, the infinite possibilities of all of life are given to us freely. And so we open ourselves this day. We open ourselves to be an instrument to be a vessel, to be a container, to be filled with all of those divine qualities that we know are the very substance of life. And so I open myself and recognize that there is love flowing and moving through this room. There is love that sustains friendships. There is a space of, of opportunity and openness to enhance all of our friendships and all of our relationships and we willingly allow ourselves in this very moment to receive that good now. And so indeed, in that same way that the scientists tell us that friendship heals, that friendship nurtures us and brings out our fullest potentials, we now stand aligned to friendship with God. And I feel and sense the way that that divine quickening within me is the very call of God for me to step forward into my own life. And each of us in our own way, we step into our own lives to be expressions of love and of joy and of peace, of beauty, of that perfect divine order. And we open ourselves to the gift of forgiveness so that we do not withhold our love from any individuals. We allow our love to just be pouring and moving and streaming out into the universe. And in that way, we are open to that law of circulation so that we in turn are filled up with that very same love. And I say, thank you, God. Thank you, life. How wonderful it is to know that this indeed is a universal law that is always acting in our behalf every desire of our heart, every healing is the revealing of the truth of our being, the expression of wholeness in our life. And in that place of great, deep, full gratitude, I release the words of this prayer. I release them and allow them to be. And together we say, and so it is. Grateful, grateful. Shining back to me, I just 
thanks for all these simple things the joy and peace that gratitude brings that's why i'm Birds. So um, I was just thinking, uh, Roman Karen, thank you for that old golden nugget. I have all my close friends are going to be getting a text this afternoon from me that says, how can I love you better? More to come on that. We'll see what, how they respond. They're going to all freak out probably. <laughs> but it'll be fun doing it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> she said, don't come to my boss. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, uh, oh, one other thing, uh, um, Fred said that, that someone found a key out in the parking lot. I actually have a, a key, so if somebody has lost a key, um, I have uh, the key. I'll give it to Cheryl, and you can uh, see if you have lost one. It, it'll be with Cheryl. All right, so now is the time to uh, recognize and celebrate the abundance of our own lives as well as the abundance of our community. So we do that by saying our joyous giving affirmation together. So let's say it together. I live in a consciousness of good. Divine love blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, and so it is. Please stand for our last song. We're going to shout it out all at the same time. Lord, make, knowing the Lord is the law, and the law is going to move into action when we do this. So you've got to be a receptacle to receive. Lord, make me an instrument of your, and then fill it in. Ready? Lord, make me an instrument of your. Beautiful. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Thanks for being here. Remember, pray often and love much.